this morning. Yes, yes. Hallelujah, Father. I have a message that I do believe will be a blessing to you. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing I do every week, though it's meaningless. I'm going to set a clock so that when it vibrates, I can ignore it. I love when the Lord downloads a message. And this past Sunday, for those of you who don't know, we have prayer every Sunday night, and you're welcome to join us. We come here at 6.30. Uh, we pray till 7-ish. And um, it's not a service. You don't sit there. You can lay here. You can walk here. You can whatever you want to do. Just pray. Amen? And so last week, last Sunday night, when I was up here praying, and I was just walking a circle up here on the stage, I heard these words on the inside. I heard the words that said, you cannot be a cave dweller and a world changer at the same time. And uh, instantly my mind went to 1 Samuel chapter 22. It's a very familiar story. We all know it. And, um, but we're going to look at it afresh today. And the title of this morning's message is, Come Out, Come Out, Wherever You Are. And so if you would, let's go ahead and go to 1 Samuel chapter 22. Let me start my time. There we go. We got 38 minutes and 26 seconds. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now I want to stop right there. Because I want you to get a picture here. You know, you know that I love backstories. If we don't know the backstory, we live in a world of snippets. We get 10 seconds of a video and think we know everything and we know nothing. And so in the Bible, we got to do more than just take a verse and think that we can preach on it. We got to look at the backstory. Who is this? Where are they coming from? What put them where they were? And so when we read this verse and we know that David escaped and went to a cave, that means nothing unless we understand why David's in a cave and who David is. David anointed of the prophet. David killer of giants. David leader of men. David dweller of caves. Sometimes life makes no sense, and we end up in places we never thought we'd be, hiding from people and from things that we never thought we'd run from. The Bible's filled with stories of men, full-grown prophetic warriors who ran from women. God, God's people have a history of hiding. And David was in hiding, and where he hid, now we know that later on, you know, about 400 people joined him, so that had to be a pretty big cave system, but that's not what was taking place here. And I want you to hear where David was, because at this time, nobody was with David. David was by himself, and according to historians and scholars, where David hid himself, because he was by himself, he had to hide himself in a place that was easily defendable and hard to find. So scholars agree that where David hid wasn't a cave like we picture a cave. It was more like a burrow, like something an animal would dig into the ground with a hole just big enough for a man to get through and a little thing on the inside where he could stay. One scholar said that David had buried himself alive. Y'all getting the picture? See, when we picture a cave, it could be this, but really it was a hole in the ground like a burrow that David would have to crawl into and hide. A place that when people went looking for him, they wouldn't look in a hole in the ground. Are y'all following me? They would search the caves but they'd walk right by that little hole in the ground and not know that's where the slayer of giants, the anointed man of God, the prophesied king of Israel, was hiding. This is where David was physically. 
Where was David spiritually? Where was David emotionally? I like David. I can't wait to meet David. Because of all the characters in the Bible, David is the one transparent enough that he always gives us the backstory. He always gives us a, a portrait of his heart when he was gone. When David was happy, we know he danced like nobody dances. You understand what I'm saying? When David was happy, he danced his clothes off. When David was sad, he soaked his bed in tears. And we know this because David expressed it. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to put on airs. He said, this is what I am. This is where I am. This is what I like that. Because, you know, some people want to pretend life is always bad, and it ain't always bad. And others want to pretend life is always good, and it ain't always good. I want to read the story of somebody who had highs and had lows. Because I can relate to someone that has highs and has lows. And so if you would, go to Psalm 142, because this is where David wrote on paper his heart. A Psalm of David, this is how it starts. I'm reading it to you out of the New Living Translation. I'm going to read the whole chapter because it's only seven verses. A Psalm of David regarding his experience in the cave. A prayer. I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. Now, understand that at this point in David's life, he was being pursued by mad King Cray Cray. You may not have read King Cray Cray. You call him Saul. I call him crazy. David, Saul had one ambition that overrode every other desire, and that was kill David. That's the thing he wanted more than anything. And he put a bounty on David's head, once again, according to scholars and historians, that was so great that a man's family could have lived to three generations on the bounty that Saul had placed on David's head. When taxes are high and the economy is poor, like in this time, David didn't know who he could trust. He couldn't even trust his own family because we know that David's daddy wasn't real fond of David. David's brothers weren't exactly brothers in arms, right? So for all David knew, his own family would be willing to trade him in for that kind of money. David didn't know if there was a soul in Israel that he could look to. Mercenaries and assassins had been hired to track him down. And so this is why David said that wherever I go, enemies have set traps for me. Verse 4, I look for someone to come and help me. But no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Y'all ever felt this way? This is what David, no one gives a rip about me. I'm hiding in a hole. I fought their battles. Everything King Cray Cray wanted me to do, I did. He told me to go get a hundred Philistine skins. I got them. Whatever he told me to do. See, listen, I'm going to jump out a little ahead of me. Sometimes the thing that hurts most is when we're attacked for nothing other than being. Ain't done nothing wrong. We've done everything they wanted of us, and yet they turn on us. This is where David was. David, David's one crime, his only crime, was being a man of vision. Amen. Having purpose, having destiny, having been anointed. That was David's only crime. And the king that he had served was now hunting him. And David said, no one cares about me. I served, I gave, I did what they told me. They did what they asked of me. I fought their battles. And now they all hunt me. Verse 5, then I pray to you, O Lord, I say, you are my place of refuge. 
you are all I really want in life. Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Now listen to what he says here. Bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. And then in, if we go back to 1 Samuel and you look at verse 3, David had dropped off his parents for safekeeping, and then he made a statement that also lets us know where he was. He said, in essence, watch my parents until I know what God will do with me. Until I know. See, sometimes... We're people of faith, absolutely. We believe. David said, I believe there's going to come a day when good people will be around me again. Yes, sir. But at this moment in time, I don't know exactly what God's going to do with me. I love this story because I can relate. Can you all relate? Yes, what drove David into hiding? As we already said, it was this crazy king who was going to do anything to kill him, and life was so harsh and his environment so bad that David had no other choice but to run out into a wilderness, find a burrow, crawl into the hole, and hide. And that's the backstory of today's come out, come out, wherever you are. There's a rabbit already. Y'all don't see these rabbits. I see rabbits everywhere. God, in his entire history of dealing with people, have always, he's always been asking them to come out. God's people seem to like to hide, and God is always seeking. And I don't know if y'all ever played hide and seek when you were a kid, but if you had, when you found a really good hiding place, you didn't want to come out even when the game was over. <laughs> Because you didn't want to give up that hiding place. And that's humorous when you're a child and your hiding place is in the closet. But it's disastrous when you're an adult and your hiding place is away from God. And away from God's people. But no matter what the coaxing is, dinner's ready, I ain't coming out. The game's over, I ain't coming out. That no matter how they try to coax you out, you don't want to come out. And many of God's people, like I said, you could go and read the story of Gideon. Y'all have ever heard of Gideon? Gideon was in hiding. But you can go all the way back to the beginning. To our original parents. And you remember the story that the Bible says Adam heard the spirit of the Lord. It was actually, it's the Rahu, it's the wind of God. Most translations say in the cool of the day, it ain't got nothing to do with temperature. It had to do with the Spirit of God moving in the garden. And Adam heard the sound, and he was familiar with the sound, which proves it was a common, ordinary sound. He heard it on a regular basis. But this time, Adam did something he ain't never done before. When he heard the sound, he looked at Eve and he said, He's coming, hide! Y'all yep. yep. know the story? Yes. And so when God gets to what was probably their meeting place and Adam wasn't there, the Lord cried out, come out, come out, wherever you are. Well, that doesn't exactly fit scripture, but it does help my sermon. Because <laughs> in the Bible, what God said was, Adam, where are you? Now, allow me to camp on this for a little bit, because when God asks a question, he's never asking for information. Right? God knew where Adam was. I mean, the Bible lets us know that if there's a sparrow flying out in the middle of the greatest national forest in our nation, and for some reason in the middle of the forest without an eye, a camera, an iPhone, anywhere to be seen, the sparrow falls from the sky, God knows where the sparrow fell, why the sparrow fell, and when the sparrow yeah. fell. When the first leaf of autumn loses its grip on a branch, God knows what leaf it was. God knows these things. He knew where Adam was. So when God asked you or me a question, he's not seeking information. 
It's all about self-evaluation. What he was asking Adam is, dude, where are you? Where's your head? Where's your heart? Where are you? And listen to what Adam told him. Adam said, I was naked, so I was afraid, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Now, we could, I could preach a whole other sermon on how the glory of God had clothed him but now departed, but that's another sermon for another time. What's interesting in this is that God asked him two questions, and it's the first question that we need to pay attention to for today. God never debated him theologically why you're naked. He never condemned Adam for being naked. He never said, well, Adam, you know you wouldn't have known that if you just obeyed me. If you just done what I told you to do, you wouldn't be in this position. I love spiritual counselors like talk like that. Right? You come to them when you're in pain, and they tell you all the reasons why you caused it. Right? Y'all, and I, some, when I've had people do that, I, I, I'm not above saying, dude, you better shut up before I hit you. Because I know I messed up. I don't need you to tell me I messed up. I messed up. I'm not coming to you to tell me I messed up. I know I messed up. I need you to help me get out of what I did. Don't point out my flaws. I know my flaws. I want someone that will treat me like God would. So God doesn't get into a theological, philosophical debate about why Adam was naked. What he asked him was so amazing. He said, who told you you were naked? Who told you? Who made your nakedness a point of shame? Right? And God still asks us that question. Who told you you weren't enough? Who told you you didn't measure up? Who told you you were the wrong person at the wrong time, the wrong shape, the wrong color, the wrong size? Who told you you weren't talented enough? Who told you you weren't anointed enough? Who told you you were unqualified? Who told you... Who carried those words to you that wounded your heart? He never debated with them his nakedness. He wanted to know who made your nakedness a point of shame. And then he called them out. And this is uh, years ago when I was studying this, this is where I learned God and everyone say, I'm listening. Because you need to hear this. God cannot heal what you conceal. He always calls you out of your hiding place, not to expose you to more shame and more pain, but to heal you of what drove you in there in the first place. He doesn't join you in the hiding place. He calls you out of the hiding place so that he can heal you of the wounds those words caused. Who told you that? Who told you you could never sing, you could never dance, you could never build that business? Who drove you into hiding? Hmm. Let's go to verse 2. As you're turning to verse 2, this is we got to understand that when we're in hiding, we can never become what God called us to be. We can never become a world changer while we're cave right. dwellers. On, and when we're dwelling in the cave, there's two, I'm going to show you two things. There's, there's two ways to identify you're in hiding. One is by how you talk, and two is by who will hang with you. And when David was in the cave, and this is what we're about to read, there was only certain types of people that would join him. World changers didn't join David in the cave, because world changers are not cave dwellers. World changers are out in the world changing the world. You don't find mountain climbers in the cave. Mountain climbers are on the mountain, right? So when David was in the cave, it wasn't champions who joined him. Listen to what the Bible says. Is this okay this morning? Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him and he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. Now let's look at this. Notice who joined. Those who were in distress. Distress means those who knew extreme anxiety, pain, and sorrow. This is who joined themselves to David. 
Now, I, I'm not going to be able to get into it today, but what's amazing is when we come out of hiding, when we allow God to coax us out of our safe place, which is really a dangerous place, but when we allow God to coax us out, he can take us and make us mighty men and mighty women. Because these 400 who were in debt, discontented, and in distress, later on became David's mighty men. But you got to come out. Are you all here this morning? You can't stay. And, and the people of God hide in all kinds of ways. People of God, we hide ourselves in our occupation. We hide ourselves in our hobbies. We hide ourselves in crowds. Right? I, I was sharing with Cleve this morning, I can't tell you how many people it's more than who I, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. More than I can count on both my hands. That was humorous right there. Y'all just missed it. Yeah, thank you. That was funny. An obligatory ha-ha. There we go. People who have told me, Pat, I would love to be at RLC, but I attend and they'll name a mega church. You would love to be here, but you go there. Why? I can, and this, God is my witness, hand on my heart. I can hide out there. I can hide in the crowd because nobody knows me, nobody sees me, nobody places any expectations on me. I can sneak in and I can sneak out. But once again, that's great when you're playing a game as a child. But if you and I are ever going to be world changers, we got to quit playing hide and seek, and we got to come out of our hiding place and say, here I am. With my dreams, my talents, my skill sets, my personality, here I am. God's always calling us out. So the, the, those who are in distress, they knew extreme anxiety, pain, and sorrow. Those who were in debt, who had lost everything and had no hope. And the discontent are those who were dissatisfied with their life. But God is too gracious. Listen, God didn't give you and I potential so we could bury it in the ground. Miles Monroe used to say that the graveyard, the most, and I won't be able to quote it exactly, but the most horrible thing about the graveyard is that so much potential is buried there. Because men and women of God died hiding their dreams what they were supposed to be, the gift that they were meant to be to their generation was never unwrapped. Not because it wasn't needed. You are needed. What you say, you people need to hear. If it's in you, it needs to come out. There's not a one of you that's insignificant. There's not a one of you that's worthless. There's not a one of you that's meaningless. If God created you, God don't create no junk. He creates treasure. People make you feel like trash, but God never does. If it's in you, it needs to come out. And just and I, I just because they couldn't spot it doesn't mean it wasn't in there. Sometimes blind people can't see potential. So God is so gracious. That just like he did to Adam, and just like he did to Gideon, and just like he did to David, and just like he's doing for you right now, he coaxes us out of our hiding places. It doesn't matter whether it's a wine press, an animal's burrow, or a fig leaf. God says you got to come out. So what did David do? Well, let's go. Let's go to. Let, uh, what did God do? Go to. Twenty. There's so many rabbits. There's so many places to go right now. 1 Samuel 22, verse 5. The prophet Gad said to David, what is a prophet? A deliverer of words. That's all a prophet is. A prophet is just someone who delivers words. We, we make them into something special, but a prophet's nothing more than a delivery man. God speaks, they deliver. So God spoke to a prophet named Gad. And he said, I want you to go to David, and here's what you got to say to David. Do not stay in the stronghold. Do not stay in hiding. Do not stay in the cave. Do not stay in the pit. Do not stay behind your fig leaf. Do not hide yourself in the crowd. Depart and go into the land of Judah, 
So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Now there's a couple things that are really interesting here that you can interpret into what David said. Is this or what Gad said? Is this okay? The first thing he said is do not stay in the stronghold, but go into the land of Judah. Listen to this. When David was in the cave, we know from reading Psalm 142, what was he doing? Pouring out his complaints. What does Judah mean? It means praise. So in essence, what God was saying to David, it's time for you to quit complaining and start praising. You can this, I, I told you there's going to be two ways you can always tell when someone's in hiding. One is cave dwellers are complainers. That's all they do. So if you are constantly complaining, if your complaints outweigh your praise, baby, you in hiding. And you're mad at the world because they don't recognize you for the wonder that you are, but you're hiding your light. How are we ever supposed to know how wondrous you are when you hide yourself all the time? When you're unwilling to say, I've got a dream, I've got a passion, I've got a pursuit. There's something I want to do with my life. Sometimes we got to just take a risk and say, Pastor, I believe I can do something. It's time to stop David. It's time for you to quit complaining and start praising. That's the first thing we could read into this. The second thing we could read into this is, listen to this, your dreams and your purposes and your calling are not private things. They're meant for public display. If God gave you a purpose, your purpose ain't about you. If God gave you a dream, your dream ain't about you. So your dream can never be manifested in isolation because it ain't about you. And when you're in isolation, you are your only company. How many times are you going to prophesy to yourself? I'm all for motivational statements, but there comes a time I can't preach in the mirror anymore. I need to see you. I need to take a risk and step out in a public place. And I understand and realize I ain't as good as him. I ain't as deep as her. I'm just me. So I take a risk to show all of you here is who I am, and this is how I dance. Now, you might not like me, but that's okay because there's 600 other churches in Greenville. Ain't all of them open right now, but they there. Right? And if, 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 listen, if I'm not your cup of tea, they serve green tea over there. And that's cool and that's fine. But you and I, see, you got to understand, ain't everyone going to applaud you. Ain't everyone going to like you. It ain't about everyone doing it. All you got to do is risk that someone, somewhere, will appreciate you. Because God made you for someone else. And as long as you and I are in hiding, because we're, we're hurt by what they said. Their words wounded us. And there ain't no, that, you know that old adage, it's such a lie. Well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never, that is such a lie. Because you can heal from sticks and stones in a couple days, but sometimes words, they'll last and last. And some of you still remember what you were told as a child, and you're struggling with it. Because the wounds from the sticks are long gone. But the scars from the words remain. And so we've got to be wounded or healed of those wounds so we can come out of hiding and say, I know I was created for something. And it wasn't to live my life in the pit. Everyone say this with me. Come out. Come out. Wherever you are. That's one of the reasons why we constantly say real life church is a safe place. I don't allow sheep to hurt sheep here. I have, I have literally told people you need to leave. I'm trying to build a church, but I ain't afraid of running some people off. Because if they're dangerous to the sheep, they don't belong here. Because if we're ever going to manifest our dreams... We've got to be in the right place. We've got to be in a safe place. If I'm going to become who God created me to be, I need a safe place. 
And if you're going to become who God created you to be, you need a safe place. That's why we will always and forever demand that RLC is a safe place. Oh, you might get challenged, and from time to time I'll say things in a sermon you might disagree with. But that's okay, I'm right and you're wrong. Or vice versa. I was wrong before I thought, then I discovered I was wrong. All right, here's the, here's the next thing, the th third thing that you can read into verse 5. Judah was David's tribe of his own, his own people. And Brother Hagin used to always tell us that it's important you get among your own company. Listen to this. Some have shared their dreams and purposes with the wrong people. And that's why you were hurt. Because you weren't among your own people. You, David wasn't among the people of Judah. He was among another people. And when you're around a group of people who can barely tolerate you to begin with, and then you begin to share your dreams and your visions, and you wonder why they don't celebrate you. Well, they could barely tolerate you. They're going to celebrate you. They could barely tolerate you when you were dreamless. Now you tell them, I got a dream. Y'all ever remember Joseph and his brothers? Yeah, when you're around a people who can't tolerate you, that's a good place to share your dreams. I've got a dream. I'm going to be a millionaire, and they all broke. Yeah, they're going to celebrate you. You got, a, you got a dream, you're going to build your own business, and they all on welfare. Yeah, they're going to celebrate you. No, when a people can barely tolerate you when you're dreamless, then when you get a dream, you share your dream with the wrong people, and then you wonder why they persecute you and not celebrate you, and then you use their words as a reason to go into hiding. No, no, no. You got you to gotta be among the right people. You got to make sure that when you uncover your dream, you're telling it to dreamers. God said, David, listen, part of your problem was you shared your dream. He told the, the king, found out that's called to be the king. You think a king is going to celebrate the next king? No, 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 no. Sometimes you need to hold on to your dream. For a treasure. And when you get into the right environment with the right people, then you say, here's what I believe God will do for me. Yeah. And if they're the right people, they are going to celebrate your dream as if that's their dream. Yeah. They're going to rally around you and they're going to say, I want to see you break the mold. Because when you break through that ceiling, we're going to follow in your wake and we're coming right up behind yeah. you. I want to see someone walk in that kind of anointing. I want to see someone build that kind of business. I want to see someone build that kind of church. Because if you can do it and we're in partnership together, I'm doing it right there with you. And what God does for you, God will do for me. me. Amen. And this goes back to last week. We got to understand that just because you have a dream doesn't mean God passed me up. We're all God's trophies. Right. And when I understand that God values me now, I'm free to value you. I remember when I first got started and I would I would be in church and the, the, the pastor was anointed. It would make me mad. Because I wanted to be anointed. And I figured if he had an anointing, there wasn't enough for me. So when he was anointed, I got mad because I figured the pie is only so big. And you ate too much anointing, bro. Cost some of it back up. Then I discovered that there's more than enough grace to go around. That God can prosper you, and that don't mean you're stealing from me. God can raise you up. That doesn't mean you're keeping me down. All of us can rise together because the grace of God is sufficient for all of us. So when you break through, I don't break down. All I say is thank you for breaking the ceiling because now I'm coming through it too. Come out, come out, wherever you are. So here's what God did for David. And here's what God does for each of us that have been wounded and hid. He sends us a word. God always sends a word. That's all a prophet is, is a deliverer of words. Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them. I want to say that again. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Now that word destructions in the original Hebrew can be equally translated pit. 
And isn't it amazing that a man who lived in a pit understood that a pit is destructive? It's destructive to the dream. It's destructive to the... Sometimes what you and I think is safety is actually destruction. Pastor, what do you mean? There are those who, when they see the future, they become intimidated by it. So the Bible says they shrink back. And what do they shrink back to? Their own destruction. Because they think, I'm going to go back to where he beat me. I'm going to go back to where I had nothing. I'm going to go back to where I only had leeks and onions. Because at least I knew what was there. I don't know what's out here in the land of freedom. I know what to expect being a slave. So they run back to slavery thinking it's safety. And what it actually is is destruction. So this is what David said here. He said, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructive tendency to hide in the pit. And what brought him out of the pit? The word. Are y'all here this morning? Dr. T.L. Osborne always said, listen to this, that the word is better than the touch. What do you mean by that? Sometimes what we want is we want someone to run to the pit and, you know, and prophesy over us and lay their hands on us and do all these things and touch us. A touch is comforting, but a word is delivering. The touch is momentary. The touch, once, once I lift my hand off you, that touch is gone. But if I give you a word, you can hide it in your heart. You got that wherever you go. So the word that God sends to heal is better than the touch you might get. When I'm hurting, I need a word more than I need sympathy. I want the hugs. Y'all know I'm a hugger. I'll chase you down in the hallway to get a hug. But I covet the word. So when, you're, when you and I are in hiding... God does what he always does. He sends a word. Hmm. When you're in distress, you need a word. When you're in debt, you need a word. You know, I heard Andrew Walmack say one time, he said, if I ever again had a financial... Am I on now? You notice when I get cleaves, Mike, I go deep. A word is better than a touch. Now listen to this in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17. Because this, this verse is connected. Listen to this. I will give you back your health and heal your wounds, says the Lord, for you are called an outcast. Being called an outcast was the cause of their wounds. Some of you have been called names that wounded your heart. Some of you have been spoken to in such a way that you sought the safety of the pit. And you thought the best thing I can do with my dream is hide it. But God said, I'm going to give you back your health and I'm going to heal you of your wounds, for you have been called, but you and I need to understand that what they called you is different than what God has named you. And you and I need to learn to identify with what he's named us, not what they called us. Because all they could do is call us according to what they could see with natural eyes. But God has named us according to his prophetic vision. So believe that your identity is in his naming of you, not their calling of you. Mm. I'm making myself happy right here. So God, God sends him a word and he says, David, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come out. You need to come out of the pit. You need to come out of the cave. And in my imagination, listen, like I said, nobody wants to come out of a good hiding place. And you can almost picture David, if David's anything like me, he'd say, I don't want to come out. They still out there. And they is. The ones who wounded you are still out there. They still got their sticks. They still got their stones. They still got the bows. They still got their arrows. They still got their cusses. And they still got their curses. 
But what God is trying to do for you and I is to realize there is someone who's for you that is greater than those who are against you. So what he's saying is, I know they out here, David. I know they're still out here, but so am I. And I am your shield. I am your buckler. I am your seeding great reward. So you need to come out of that hiding place because I've got a better one for you. And the better hiding place is in me. So it takes courage. This is the reason why. Y'all give me a few more minutes. See, it's going off right there. Boom. Shut it down. Christianity, truly lived, authentically lived, and I'm not talking about the game, but I'm talking about true Christianity ain't for the weak of heart because it takes courage. This is why over in the Bible, over and over again, the Bible will repeat this phrase, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. Be strong. Did I say it? Be strong. I'll say it again. Be strong. This is what the this is the language of the Bible. Why? Because you've got to be strong and courageous to come out of that hiding place knowing that the ones who said that to you, they're still out there waiting on you. But you got to come out of the cave to be what God created you to be. Because your dream will never be made manifest in hiding. Mm. We must learn and know that God has a greater ability to protect us than they do to harm us. That God has a greater capacity to bless us than they do to curse us. Christians ought never to have more faith in the curse than they do the blessing. That God has a greater capability to promote us than they do to keep us down. If you and I will walk by faith, they can't hold you back. Don't tell me nothing about nothing that they are against you and they won't let you break through. If God be for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. Because if God has to move a thousand people out of your way, he will move them out of your way because he will promote you who believe. Quit using them as an excuse not to accomplish your dream. Well, pastor, I sang a song and they didn't clap. We'll sing it again. Well, I shared my business plan and they said it would never work. We'll share it again. I knocked on the door. They told me to go away. Knock on another door. Everyone say this with me. God is the greater one. The greater one is in me. The greater one is for me. Hallelujah, Father. I'm going to try to bring this to a close. The Lord will always call you out of hiding. David had to be in Judah to become king. He had to be around the right group of people. It was true of David, true of Adam, and it's true of you. You can't be a world changer and a cave dweller. It's time to come out and try again. Give it another tempt. How long are you going to keep hiding your talents? You know, there's a story in the Bible. There's a lot of them, but there's one in particular I'm thinking. Where Jesus told the story of a wealthy man who had three employees. And he gave the first employee five talents. Everyone say talents. God's given you talents. That's not the question. The question is, are you using them? Or have you let them talk you out of it? God gave the first one five talents. The first one went out into the public square. He laid it all on the line and he took a risk. And in the proper time, he came back to his master and he said, Master, you gave me five. I went out there and I turned the five into ten. Here, this is yours. And the, the, the master said, well done, you good and faithful servant. And then the second one who had gotten two did the same thing. He went out and he took a risk. He only got two, but that's what I got. I'm going to use it. He went out into the public square, took a risk, came back with four. He said, Master, you gave me two. God's all about increase. And he came, he came in and he gave him that and he said, I got four. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Then there was another one that got one. I am case 
Number one, that you can work with one. I only got one skill, and this is it right here. I've had people tell me, it's a good thing you know how to preach because you don't do much else. I think they meant it as an insult. I took it as a compliment. Huh? Oh, it is true. I've had people say that to me. And listen, you know, I, you're pretty annoying. All I heard was pretty. It's all about perspective. This one got one talent. You ain't got nothing to be embarrassed of if you've only got one talent. It's not about how much you got. It's about what you, how you use what you got. This one had one talent. He went out and he buried it in a pit. That's what the Bible says. Let's look at the verse. Is this okay? Can you give me just a few more minutes? Verse 25 of Matthew 25. I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you can have back what is yours. I didn't use it, but I didn't lose it. Do you all know what happened to him? He didn't get promoted. How long are you going to bury your talent? And what do you suppose the Lord is going to say if you leave this earth with your potential untapped? Do you think he's going to pat you on the back and say, Cleve, I understand, man, life was hard. I would have helped you if I could have, but you know, I kind of had my hands tied. No, no, no. The Lord wants you to use the dream he gave you. He wants you to employ it. He wants you to risk putting it out there. Not everyone's going to applaud it, but somebody somewhere needs what you've got. Is this okay this morning? Hallelujah, Father. I, got, I don't got, I, I got three more lines. When life comes at you and you encounter the enemies of your potential, there is one approved hiding place. It's not a fig leaf. It's not a massive crowd. It's not a pit. If you would, put up on the screen Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. Here's your one approved hiding place. Because there's no denying sometimes life gets hard. And there's no denying that sometimes people don't applaud you. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's the only approved hiding place. If you need a refuge because they're not applauding you, don't run away, run in two. He'll keep you safe. And he'll hide you without your dream dying in the ground. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? All right. Well, we do have a couple of announcements for you. If we can get the prayer team to come up. If you need prayer this morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, could I implore you not to leave without making Jesus your Lord? It's not a boring life, trust me. He'll take you places you'll never would have dreamed you'll be. Hallelujah. If you need healing in your body, we have a prayer team that knows how to pray for you. We invite you to come up. And with that.